Hello, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the History in the Bible podcast. All the history, in all the books, in all the Bibles. Episode 1.44 The House of Omri, Pinnacle of Power King Asar of Judah died of athlete's foot somewhere between 878 and 870 BC. He lived to see the extinction of the Israelite house of Baashar and its replacement by the house of Omri. Omri's house reigned for 40 years under four kings, Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah and Jehoram. Omri's house was the first of Israel to last beyond the second generation. In my history of the Omrids, I am going to follow the views of modernist historians and archaeologists. As I said way back in my first episode, I don't claim to be objective. I am pushing one particular point of view. But I always try to show how modernist ideas differ from older scholarly frameworks. In my defence, I can only say that the past 40 years of scholarship vindicates modernist theories more than it rebuts them. The Omrid kingdom was the zenith of Israel's power and prosperity. The Omrids were the first to extend Israelite rule out of the northern highlands into the lush lowlands of Galilee and the Jordan Valley. They were the first to employ literate scribes, people who could keep enduring records. Recent archaeology seems to indicate the Galilee had a remnant Canaanite population. If that is so, then the Omrids ruled a state, not just of Hebrews, but a variety of others, people who worshipped other gods. The archaeological evidence is that Israel reached a level of economic strength unprecedented in its history, and would make of its southern neighbour Judah a vassal. Even the Book of Kings had to admit that. Israel attained a population possibly greater than even Aram Damascus, and certainly many times greater than the puny kingdom of Judah. New settlements appeared in the northern hill country, the areas of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. We are now at last in Iron Age II. The Omrids built extensively. They established a new capital city at Samaria in the northern highlands. They built a palace there larger than any structure in the entire Levant until Herod the Great rebuilt the temple in Roman times, 800 years later. They allied themselves by marriage to Phoenicia, They dominated Moab, at least until Ahab's time. They forged international alliances and constructed a substantial military. They did all this under the shadow of a resurgent Assyria. You wouldn't know anything about that from the Book of Kings. In Kings, the story of the House of Omri is told in a whopping 16 chapters. But it is not a story of a great kingdom. It is a story of moral failure. It is the story of the two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, who tried to bring Omri's house to heel. The narratives are colourful and dramatic. Two women take centre stage as villains. First is Jezebel, the Phoenician wife of King Ahab of Israel. Second is their daughter Athaliah, who married King Jehoram of Judah and who reigned as Queen Regnant after Jehoram's death. The biblical writers went out of their way to suppress the success of the Omrids. In Kings, Omri is allowed only 13 verses, most of which describe events prior to his actual reign. As far as the Deuteronomist, the author of Kings, was concerned, the most important point to be made about the Omrids was that they patronised the worship of the god Baal to an unprecedented degree. The very idea that the Omrids might have been successful monarchs was inconceivable. The Deuteronomist held it as an article of faith that Yahweh granted success only to those kings who remained faithful to him 
and who succoured the temple in Jerusalem. The chronicler, on the other hand, has no interest in Israelite affairs. He mentions the Omrids only when they figure in the treatment of King Jehoshaphat of Judah, who lived through both Omri and his son Ahab's reign. The archaeologists of the early 20th century followed the Bible's lead. They assigned many magnificent building projects to the Omrids, but their rule was not seen as significant, a sidetrack to the main agenda of biblical archaeology. The traditional scholarly view, following the Bible, holds that King David founded the first Hebrew state, a state that built palaces, storehouses, fortifications, and other great works. The modernists think that is just wrong. The two kingdoms were not a single Hebrew population. The northern kingdom was ethnically diverse, part Hebrew, part Canaanite, part Aramaean. Israel had little to do with the southern Judean hillbillies. It was not David of Judah who founded the first Hebrew kingdom. It was Omri, of Israel, 120 years after David's death. Why Omri? Why then? One theory is that most of the tiny states of the Levant only evolved in the face of Assyrian pressure. When we last left the kingdom of Israel, it was run by Baashar, the man who had extinguished the house of Jeroboam. Unusually for an Israelite king, Baashar died in 882 BC of natural causes. Murder and mayhem followed. Quote, 1 Kings 16.8 In the 26th year of King Asa of Judah, Elah, son of Baashar, began to reign over Israel in Terzah. He reigned two years, but his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him. When he began to reign, as soon as, as he had seated himself on his throne, he killed all the house of Baashar. He did not leave him a single male of his kindred or his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Baashar, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baashar by the prophet Yahu, because of all the sins of Baashar, and the sins of his son Elah that they committed, and that they caused Israel to commit, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. End quote. After a mere seven days, the commander of the army, Omri, staged a counter coup. He attacked Zimri in the capital city of Tazar. Zimri conveniently burnt himself to death in his own palace. After a few years of civil war against an otherwise unknown Tibni, Omri emerged as unchallenged king. Omri's origins are mysterious. Uniquely, the Bible fails to record his father's name or his tribe. Was he a foreigner? His name suggests that he may have been an Aramean or a Phoenician. In 879 BC, Omri took over a kingdom defeated by Aram Damascus. It had recently suffered coup and counter-coup and civil war. He saved it from disintegration. By the end of his ten-year reign, he had stabilised the country, fought off Aram Damascus, built a new capital city at Samaria, forged alliances with Tyre, and vexed mightily the kingdom of Moab across the Jordan. For centuries thereafter, the Assyrians knew Israel as the house of Omri. Samaria was a good choice for a capital. It would later survive a three-year siege by the Assyrians. Samaria was much better placed for international communication than the old capital of Tazar. The city was nearer to the Egyptian way of the sea. It also overlooked the direct east-west route from the Mediterranean coast to the interior of the hill country. Omri was intent on breaking free from the hill country, turning his face to the vast trade of the Mediterranean. Omri converted the entire summit into a palace complex, beginning the first great infrastructure works ever undertaken by the Hebrews. 
much to the chagrin of the Deuteronomist, Omri died peacefully in 869 BC after a reign of ten years. During Omri's reign, Assyria emerged from its slumber, led by King Ashanasapal II, who would have a long reign of 24 years. Ashanasapal undertook extensive building projects and conducted numerous military campaigns, crossing the Euphrates into Syria and Phoenicia. Ashanasapal had a lot of fun doing what Assyrians do. We have a cuneiform inscription of his, where he describes the subtle art of Assyrian diplomacy. Quote, I flayed as many nobles as had rebelled against me, and draped their skins over the pile of corpses. Some I spread out within the pile, some I erected on stakes upon the pile. I felled fifty of their fighting men with the sword, burnt two hundred captives from them, and defeated in a battle on the plain three hundred and thirty-two troops. With their blood I dyed the mountain red like red wool, and the rest of them the ravines and torrents of the mountains swallowed. I carried off captives and possessions from them. I cut off the heads of their fighters, and built therewith a tower before their city. I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. I felled three thousand of their fighting men with a sword. I captured many troops alive. I cut off from some their arms and hands. I cut off from others their noses, ears and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one of heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. End quote. Simple times. In Omri's beneficent reign, the Assyrians were only a distant thundercloud on the Bible's horizon. That storm rolled slowly but inexorably towards the Levant during the time of Omri's son, Ahab, a calf. The biblical authors detested Ahab. Quote, 1 Kings 16.31 not content to follow the sins of Jeroboam, he took as wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbaal of the Phoenicians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made a sacred post. Ahab did more to vex Yahweh, the God of Israel, than all the kings of Israel who preceded him. End quote. Two black marks. Ahab has a foreign wife, and he worships foreign gods. At this point, Elijah, Eliyahu, meaning maybe my name is God, the greatest of prophets, makes his sudden appearance and equally speedy decampment. Quote, 1 Kings 17.1 Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Gilead, said to Ahab, as Yahweh lives, the God of Israel whom I serve, there will be no dew or rain except at my bidding. The word of Yahweh came to Elijah. Leave this place, turn eastward, and go into hiding by the Wadi Kerith, which is east of the Jordan. You will drink from the Wadi, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. He proceeded to do as Yahweh had bidden. The ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening, and he drank from the wadi. End quote. While in self-imposed exile, Elijah conducts a few miracles very reminiscent of those attributed to Jesus. He takes refuge with a single mother, perpetually filling her jar of flour and a jug of oil. He even revives her son from death, or near death, after this exciting introduction, Elijah spends the rest of his career berating the polytheistic Ahab and his foreign wife Jezebel. One point not often made is that Elijah is also railing against modernization. Until the Omrits, Hebrew society was run by elders in the poor agricultural hamlets in the highlands. The Omrids created cities and an urban elite, 
to Elijah. These were Canaanite evils, created by and for a mercantile class who would trample underfoot the widows, the sick, and the oppressed. The Bible casually drops in the fact that Jezebel was killing off the prophets of Yahweh. Elijah decides to put a stop to that by issuing a challenge to 450 priests of Baal and 400 of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's a lot of priests. The royal couple accept the challenge. King Ahab assembles the nation at Mount Carmel. This is the big showdown, the ultimate test. Each side prepares a bull and lays it on an altar. The first god to ignite the divine char grill wins. To make the contest even tougher, Elijah commands that water be poured on his altar. Nothing happens to Baal's fly-blown bull. Yahweh grills his own prime cuts with ease. The people cry, Yahweh alone is God, Yahweh alone is God, and promptly kill all the foreign priests. Jezebel is unfazed by this defeat and the mass uprising against her religion. You would think that Elijah was in an unassailable position. But no, Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah. Then Elijah does something remarkable. He flees to Mount Sinai. He is the only person in the Bible recorded as returning to Mount Sinai since the great theophany during the Exodus. After the obligatory 40 days, God appears to the prophet in a manner not seen since the days of Moses. Quote, 1 Kings 19.11 God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before Yahweh, for Yahweh is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. End quote. The patriarchs spoke to God all the time. Elijah is one of the very few after Moses who had that privilege. But God has an odd directive for him. God commands Elijah to return to Israel, to foment rebellion against the house of Omri. As a bonus, he is commanded to anoint one Hazael, as king of Aram Damascus. I'll follow up on that particular thing in the next episode. Elijah has no part in the next chapter, 1 Kings 20. In that chapter, Ahab defeats King Ben-Hadad of Aram Damascus twice. Elijah next appears in a story illustrating Ahab's wickedness. Quote, 1 Kings 21.1 Naboth, Navot, owned a vineyard in Jezreel adjoining the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or I will pay you the price in money. But Naboth replied, Yahweh forbid that I should give up to you what I have inherited from my fathers. Ahab went home dispirited and sullen. His wife Jezebel said to him, Now is the time to show yourself king over Israel. Rise and eat something and be cheerful. I will get the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, for you. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived in the same town with Naboth. In the letters she wrote as follows. Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the front of the assembly, and seat two scoundrels opposite him, and let them testify against him. You have reviled God and king. Then take him out and stone him to death. His townsmen, the elders and nobles who lived in his town, did as Jezebel had instructed them. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab set out for the vineyard to take possession of it. End quote. 
Jezebel has corrupted the legal system. The Deuteronomist also wants us to note the irony of the Baal-worshipping queen accusing someone of reviling Yahweh. Elijah explodes back into the narrative to denounce Ahab. Quote, 1 Kings 21.20 Because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of Yahweh, I will bring disaster on you, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, and like the house of Baasha, because you have provoked me to anger, and have caused Israel to sin. Also concerning Jezebel, Yahweh said, The dogs shall eat Jezebel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the air shall eat. Indeed, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, urged on by his wife Jezebel. He acted most abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom Yahweh drove out before the Israelites. End quote. This mirrors the story of King David's theft of Uriah's wife. In both, a king takes what is rightfully another's and has the owner murdered. As the king is about to get away with it, a prophet confronts him with his crime. But the king's punishment is deferred to a future generation. The story doesn't quite fit where it is placed. In 1 Kings chapter 21 after a war against Aram Damascus, in which Elijah does not appear. It would have made much more sense to place it straight after chapter 19, the story of Elijah's vision in the wilderness. And that is exactly where the Septuagint puts it, inverting the chapter order of the Masoretic text. Ahab confiscated Naboth's vineyard at the instigation of a Gentile wife. The Bible repeatedly hammers home that an Israelite man's quickest way to damnation is to marry a Gentile woman. It doesn't have much to say about an Israelite woman marrying a Gentile man. Ahab's high-handed confiscation of Naboth's vineyard sounds a lot like Yahvist propaganda. Ahab surely was a pragmatist. If he had need for religion at all, it would have been to sanction his actions, not to condemn them. The Omrids went out of their way to accommodate worshippers of Baal. Letting the foreign merchants in Israel worship their own gods was a perfectly natural concession. The Yahweh Baal struggle we see in the stories of Elijah was probably only one aspect of a much more complex division. This was between the religiously tolerant rulers on the one hand and the less forbearing general population on the other between the elites in the cities, where foreign merchants were common, and the rustic supporters of Yahweh. Ahab continued his father's building program, reconstructing Jericho, and building water tunnels and storerooms at Hatzor and Megiddo. He was a capable military leader, fighting against Moab and Aram Damascus. In two of his wars against King Ben-Hadad, Ahab was not only victorious, but compassionate. Quote, 1 Kings 20:29. 20, Ben-Hadad of Aram fled and took refuge inside the town, in an inner chamber. His ministers came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, I beg you, spare my life. Ahab replied, Is he still alive? He is my brother. Go, bring him, Ahab said. Ben-Hadad came out to him. And Ahab invited him into his chariot. Ben-Hadad said to him, I will give back the towns that my father took from your father, and you may set up bazaars for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. And I, for my part, said Ahab, will let you go home under these terms. So Ahab made a treaty with him and dismissed him. End quote. That all sounds very reasonable. God had a different view of the matter. Speaking through an unnamed prophet, in the very next verse, the deity gives Ahab a right bollocking. Quote, 1 Kings 
20.35 A certain man, a disciple of the prophets, said to him, Thus said Yahweh, Because you have set free the man whom I devoted to destruction, your life shall be forfeit for his life, and your people for his people. Dispirited and sullen, the king left for home and came to Samaria. End quote. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time in the History of the Bible podcast when we follow Ahab to his death and see Elijah pass the prophetic mantle to Elisha. <laughs>